Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. I'm back, six days away in Sicily. Missed a couple of dull, quiet matches, I think. Man U in Liverpool? Nothing really happened, did they? Yeah, I know, I know. They were mad. I watched about 70 minutes or so of the Man U game while eating dinner um, on holiday. My wife was very good and allowed me to watch a big old chunk of that. Liverpool won, I had loads of internet issues. I only watched about 15, 20 minutes towards the end, which obviously were probably the most heartbreaking uh, minutes of the match. But uh, I got a, the general gist of it and I um, watched all the various key highlights afterwards as well and spoke to journalists at both games so I could get a kind of a rough idea. But but to be honest, this video isn't going to be about those matches anyway. They, they have come and gone. Um, we'll kind of touch on little themes from some of them maybe but mostly this is about returning to a victory uh, but actually before I get into any positive stuff I want to start straight away with the Sonny stuff uh, I don't I just don't understand the world I really don't um, so if you're not aware when Sonny um, came off uh, as a sub towards the end of the game, he had to do kind of a walk around the ground. He went off on the far side. Um, and there's video circulating of what certainly appears to be a racist gesture aimed towards Sonny as he goes round from one of the supporters within the uh, Crystal Palace away section. Um, and look, it's, it's... It's just horrible. It's absolutely horrible. It, it's... I, I don't understand the sense of it. I don't understand what would bring a person, a human being, to want to do that. There's no excuse for it. There's no level of anger, frustration, whatever, that can excuse something like that. Um, yeah, it's not good. Um, and to be honest, it's it's happening far too much to Sonny as well. You know, this is not the first, second, or probably even third time. I think there's there's quite a number of occasions uh, that we've seen this against various teams. And look, I must stress, we're not painting all of the Palace fans with this brush whatsoever. You know, it always appears to be one, maybe two absolute idiots that do these things. This, uh, you know, it's just one of those I could properly go off on a tangent and talk about because it's a, it's a thing about football that, you know, I just don't get. It's a thing about life I just don't get, to be honest with you. Um... But of course, it happens across the world, and yeah, it was horrible, horrible video. So I just can't even put myself in the shoes of Sonny. It must have been horrific. See, from what we could see by the videos, it looked like he went and reported it to I think Alan Dixon, the player liaison. I actually know he's called team manager technically nowadays. Um, whether that was what happened or not, I'm not entirely sure. But certainly from the way the videos we've seen, it looks like that happened. Um, but either way. It's being investigated, and the great thing about the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is that there's high-definition cameras aimed at every single seat in that place. So you do something like that, you're not getting away with it. Um, and both clubs have come out very quickly this morning. Um, Spurs statement, we're aware of an allegation of racial abuse towards Hong Min Son during yesterday's match. Discrimination of any kind is abhorrent and has no place in society. Our game and at our club, we are working with Metropolitan Police and Crystal Palace to investigate and identify the individual involved. We will do everything in our powers to ensure that if found guilty, the individual will receive the strongest possible action, as was the case earlier this season when Son suffered similar racial abuse at Chelsea. Um, the Palace statement: We are aware of a video circling online, so circulating online, as well as reports made directly to us regarding an individual in the away end at Spurs yesterday appearing to make racist gestures towards Hong Min Son. Evidence has been shared with the police, and when he is identified, he will face a club ban. We will not tolerate such behaviour in our club. Um, I'd say the Palace one, to be honest. It's even, I think, Spurs. You've got to be quite careful legally with the way you say these things. Um, and Palace, I'd say, has probably gone in the strongest there. They've very much said, you know, as soon as he's identified, it's going to face a club ban. Um and obviously, I think there'll, there'll be more to it as well with the police involved as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I just don't, I feel so sorry for Sonny. It's it's just mad. It's just mad. Honestly, I don't even, can't even get my head around it. Um, you know, it's, I think I, 
I'm not the kind of person that when I was, you know, a match going fan myself before I was a journalist, I wasn't someone that would shout personal abuse at players anyway. So, and let alone the horrific kind of racist abuse that many players kind of have to put up with as well. But even just on the personal abuse level, I see it happening. I see it happening all the time. We can see it around our press boxes, wherever we are. Um, the anger and frustration people take out on these people. And I do think, and I've said it before, and again, I'm not talking about racial abuse. That's its own separate, horrible, horrible thing. I'm talking about just um, just, just kind of normal abuse sounds really bizarre, doesn't it? It's, it sounds like I'm, I'm lessening uh, different forms of abuse, which I'm not in any way attempting to do. But, you know, I, I do wonder whether people sometimes almost dehumanise these players they see. And I think I've said this before, maybe they see them as almost characters on a TV screen they maybe watch most weeks or in a computer game they play, perhaps a FIFA or a football manager or whatever. And they just forget that these people are human beings. And so when they get angry with something that happens, they will absolutely go for them. Um, and it's horrible to see. It's so unpleasant to see. Um, but it, it's just one of those things. And I'm talking about just, I hate to say regular abuse because it shouldn't be regular. But non-racial abuse, it just seems to be something that's just maybe always going to be there. And unfortunately, at the moment, it looks like racial abuse is always going to be there. And it's just... Yeah, yeah, not uh, not good at all. Um, and literally, um, yeah, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> there's no, there's no other word. It's disgraceful. It's disgusting. And I just feel so sorry for Sonny there. So as soon as I saw clips, because we didn't see it at the time, we weren't aware of it at the ground. It was when I was coming back from the ground. I got, um, I think people tagged me in on Twitter and certain videos. As soon as I saw that, I immediately put that towards the club and just said, look. This has happened if you're not aware of it. I mean, presumably if Sonny would have said something, they would have been aware of it. Um, and then I guess it starts a whole process of what they do. So, um, so yeah. So, horrible. Absolutely horrible. But, um, yeah, you know, Sonny played really well. Um, and I do, I do wonder, wonder whether, in a sick kind of twisted way, this was their response to that. I, I don't know. I don't. I can't even legislate it, and I'm not going to try to. But Sonny played well yesterday, and for me, that's what I'm going to take away from that game and try not to focus any more on the horrible stuff uh, like that that happens. Literally at the corner of my eye, as I was just saying that, I just noticed that Vincent Company has uh, agreed a new five-year contract to continue as manager at Burnley. Um, yeah, which is interesting, actually. Um, you might have noticed. I think I did a piece yesterday if anyone read it or the day before um on the managerial situation um actually my talking points today i did that as well there seemed to have been a, a moving away from company um in anything i'd heard which presumably was because of that because that contract must have been in the offing um yeah in my talking points this morning he was not mentioned among the names and we'll talk about them towards the end of this as well um yeah yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll come to managers. Don't worry, there's going to be a whole load of stuff um, about managers as well. Um, yeah, not good. Sorry, I thought there'd been something else Spurs related there that I had to sneak into the video there. But yeah, let's get let's get on with the football. Let's talk about uh, Tottenham and a victory. Um, strange game in that it wasn't a great game to watch. It. I wouldn't say Spurs ever particularly felt in any danger. They also didn't create the tons of chances that I saw, you know, they'd done against Manu in Liverpool. They created against Manu in Liverpool. Don't know why I said that twice. Um, but yeah, there was something about it that was was pleasing. It's a, it's a victory. Um, it was yeah, it was very different. It was very different from the one that Ryan Mason put out in the in those first two games. It very much felt like he'd had a full week to prepare the team. And you could see that in the way they were set up and how organised they were. Um, and yeah, honestly, I've got, I've got to be completely honest. The start of that game, we were all kind of scrabbling to work out exactly how they were playing. Because it was such a fluid system. It was constantly changing uh, when they were in and out of possession. And when we saw the team sheet, obviously we saw Eric Dyer had been dropped. Uh, Perisic was out of it as well. Um, 
Kulusevsky out of it as well. And yeah, you were just trying to kind of work out, okay, right, so is this a back three? Is this a back four? Is If it is a back four, is it a 4-4-2? Is it a 4-3-3? Is it a 4-2-3-1? There were so many different ways to look at it. And then so we, all of us in the, in the press box, we just took... The first, you probably would, if anyone that follows us on Twitter and stuff, you probably would notice there wasn't a lot of social media activity because all of us were just watching it. Um, and yeah, so we, we worked it out. We worked it out within within a couple of minutes because you could start to see the shape becoming um, more and more defined each time they had the ball and didn't have the ball. So what it was, um, and this is fair play to Ryan Mason for training this into them over the course of this week, out of possession, they sat in a 4-4-2 shape with Pedro Porro sitting uh, as a right winger but in front of Emerson Royale. Mysteriously returned to the, the lineup. up um, We'll talk about him later and, and Ryan Mason's slight little game of subterfuge when it comes to Emerson Royale. Um, and obviously the benefit of that was that you had kind of two right backs uh, dealing with Wilfred Zaha. And obviously Perro, uh, Perro, Porro also heading up the other end of the pitch to try to um, to pin them back um, in their half as well. Um, so that was the formation out of possession, 4-4-2, old school in a way. Uh, in possession, it changed up back to a 3-4-3, maybe slightly more familiar than we, we'd seen this season, but with Emerson Real on the right-hand side of the back three, with Romero in the middle and Longley on the left. Um Ben Davies would then kind of push on up right down the left as, as essentially a wing back, which weirdly it's kind of like a reversal of the back four that Mourinho used to play with. If you remember, he used to he, he was kind of very excited about having Ben Davies coming back from an injury. I think I think he had him in the first two games and then he got injured and he was excited when he was coming back because he was able to do this back four where he pushed Serge Aurier really high up in possession. And Davies would tuck in and essentially create a back three. Um, and so, yeah, this was like the reverse of that because there's no Aurier. Instead, it was Emerson who was tucking in and Ben Davies was going up the left-hand side. Um, but it worked. It did work because it meant a Palace team that had scored a lot. I think they scored 13 goals in the last six matches. I think they've had a couple of five goals. They scored in one. It was four in another, I remember. Um Two shots on target. And these weren't even shots that were like Forster scrabbling to save. They were very comfortable collecting in his arms low saves that he made. You know, when you've got the talents of Zaha, um, Elise, Eze up there as well, they are three fantastically talented uh, players. Yet, yeah, they, they kind of lots of running and little moments where you thought they were going to get through, but... I'll be honest, because I gave in my play ratings, I gave the defenders and, and the wing backs really, or wing backs, right backs, left backs, wing backs, whatever you want to call them in, in diff, each different formation. Um, I gave them really high marks. And people were like, oh, you've gone so over the board, overboard. But I don't think so, because I think the defence dealt so well with those threats. They are players that have caused the best defenders in the Premier League absolute nightmares this season. Um, you know, Palace might not always have the goal threat. But they've got that incredible ability in the final third with those players to create chances. Um, and I thought Spurs did really well with that. You know, I'm not going to rave about their attacking performance. I didn't think it was, you know, it was terrific. But it was, you know, it it was good enough. It was good enough because of what they did at the back. It was almost like the reverse of recently where they're trying to have to outscore the opponent. Whereas this time, one kind of almost felt enough. I know towards the end they... Slightly were, you know, Paris were trying to push, but it, I, I didn't really ever feel that it was in danger, which is weird because with Spurs this season, you absolutely would feel that. Um, that clean sheet, it was their first since February. End of February would be the home game against Chelsea, wouldn't it? They had back to back ones with Chelsea and West Ham. First since then, which is ridiculous. Um, and the lineup was one that I think the majority of people seem quite happy with, obviously. I think a lot of that was Eric Dyer dropping out of the team. Um, yeah, Eric Dyer struggled. There's no getting away from it. He's had a tough time of late. Um, Mason was asked about him in his presser on Friday before the game, and he very much didn't want to single anyone out at all. Um, I kind of accidentally 
foresaw the back four coming. I asked him a question about switching to a back four, and he kind of gave this really like uh -huh, look to his press officers, like, "Is it that meme, the Paul Dano one? Does he know?" I was like, "I think it." And it's like I actually didn't. <laughs> I'd love to claim that I knew I didn't. I just thought I'd ask. I'd been away, so I thought I'd ask whether he was eventually looking to bring in the system that you know was one he was more familiar and, and comfortable with that back four. Um, but yeah, as soon as he did that, I was like, ooh, something's happening again. He's definitely going to do a back four. I didn't realise it was going to be quite the versatile uh, one that it, it ended up being. But yeah, Eric Dyer, look, it's it's a stuttering defence on the whole, but he hasn't been good. He hasn't. And you've heard me say this before. He's the guy that's meant to bring the experience to the organisation, and he's kind of done neither. I mean, watching what he did of the Liverpool Man U games... It looked like more of the same. I mean, I saw his defending for Rashford's goal. It felt very similar to me to how he, he dealt with Ian Acho, uh when Spurs went to Leicester. This kind of constantly sitting off, sitting off, sitting off. Oh, no, I've let them through on goal. <laughs> it's like, well, what were you trying to do? I get it. You don't want to rush into a rash tackle. But come on. You've got to realise at some point how close you are to the goal. And, yeah, he's just, just in a really bad spot of, a spot of form few months, I think, you know, because I think he started the season quite well, didn't he? I'm trying to remember now. It feels so long ago. I'm not on board the whole Eric Dyer is an awful player, blah, 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 all of this stuff. I do think that he can be an effective centre-back, uh, especially in a three rather than a two. But I do think concentration-wise, he, he really struggles at times. Like I say, I want him to be a leader, and I just don't know if he is. He's a very bright chap. Very uh, very good at getting what he wants across to people. But, yeah, I'm yet to see him be a kind of a, a captain type at the back. Uh, so, yes, when he was not there, it was clearly a very crowd-pleasing decision. Um, and I think just naturally, in terms of those two in the middle of a back four, it gave better balance. Because you had Romero very much suited to being on the right-hand side. You had Longley very much suited to be on the left-hand side. And, yeah... He, Dyer often plays on the left, but we know he's he's not left-footed. And, and it, yeah, they both played well, I thought, Romero and Longley, until Longley went off late on. And, and to be fair, Eric Dyer did come on for the final five... What was it? I think it was two minutes of normal time and then five of injury time, uh, added time. So seven minutes in all. And, you know, he helped them to the clean sheet. You know, some people might have been scared when they saw him come on because of, you know recent performances but you know he he played his part as well I was most impressed with Romero because I say most impressed most pleased with Romero because for me that's the performance we expect of him because he's that good he's got the potential to be that good he really has he um when he controls his aggression and just lets it simmer on that edge he can be absolutely dominant when he fails to control his um, aggression, he becomes reckless. It's such a fine line between dominant and reckless. But yesterday was very much a dominant thing. Um, honestly, like I say, taking on Zaha, Elise and Eze a lot of the time, who were cutting inside and everything, I thought he did really, really well. Um, he was very disciplined. Um, and, and Spurs benefit hugely when he's like that. He just It's another one. It's another player that needs to focus. I know he's younger, isn't he? Was he 24? Um, no, 25 now, actually. Um, but yeah, no, I was really, really pleased. I've got his stats as well. Three tackles, five interceptions, won six aerial duels, and he completed a huge eight clearances. <laughs> his stats were like right up. I think it was only tackles that he wasn't top of because there was... Oh, I forgot his name. It was a Palace defender that had more tackles. But yeah. And he played this amazing Toby alderweireld esque pass through to Sonny for a big chance in the second half as well. So, um, yeah. I was really pleased with Romero. He's... I've been critical of him. Um, and I think, you know, quite a few Spurs fans have as well. Because obviously this is a World Cup winner. This is a guy who was Serie A Defender of the Year. Um, had a decent first season. But obviously injuries, I think, have robbed him of too many Spurs games over the last two seasons but this performances like this show exactly what Spurs have bought um, they get the right man to kind of coach him and he'll be he'll be absolutely superb um, but yeah I think it was the system to be fair the system 
helped a lot of the defence as well. It helped them have that little bit of security. Um, you know, Mason's got a good staff around him as well. Matt Wells. Matt Wells, if you're not aware who Matt Wells is, he was a very talented... I think he played in the academy at Spurs, if I remember correctly. When I was way back, I remember him as an academy player. Um, and then he became a very well-regarded coach within the academy setup. He assisted Scott Parker when Scott Parker was under-18s boss. Then he went with him to Fulham and Bournemouth. I think he went abroad with him as well recently. Went there that rather... Was it in Belgium? Rather ill-fated spell... But it doesn't diminish the fact that as a very, I think he's only 34. Um, I might have written it down here. No, he didn't. I think he's 34, 35, something like that. He's, um, yeah, he's very well regarded. And I think having him alongside Ryan Mason, despite the fact that he's quite young himself, um, I think he's a very, he's been around. He, he's been, you know, he's he's been in the dugout for a lot of matches um, in the Championship, in the Premier League as well. So, yeah, I think he's been a very good person to lean on for, for Mason. Um, who would have, presumably, it would have known him from. I was trying to think if it, when he was with Park with the under 18s, whether Mason was involved in the setup yet. He might have been doing some kind of stuff with them. I'm trying to remember. But yeah, either way. Um, sorry, and I also didn't say Matt Wells. It's also the grandson of Cliff Jones, the uh, double winning uh, Welsh wizard at Tottenham. Back in the the sixties, loveliest guy is uh, probably as fit now as well as, as most people about half his age. I uh, interviewed him a few years back, and he's an absolutely lovely guy. Um, but yeah, system worked. Um, yeah, I know. Like I said earlier, they didn't create the amount of chances they did against Liverpool, Man U, but they shut out Paris for long periods. And I'd say the four best opportunities of the game probably fell to Spurs. You had Romero heading against the crossbar. You had, what was the next one? Kane, obviously, heading the winner. Porro had a deflected shot that was creeping under the bar that was tipped over. And then, obviously, Sonny's big chance in the second half. So, I'd say probably those are the four. Palace had one. I'm trying to remember who it was now. He poked it over the bar. I think Davies put on quite a good bit of pressure on him. I can't remember who it was. But, yeah, I'd say Spurs probably had the four best chances of the game. Um, and yeah, so on another day, you know, they put more of those, and that's a 2 3 0 comfortable win. Um, so yeah, system worked, fair play tactically. Um, exactly, you know, what uh, what you'd need. Um, yeah, exactly. What need. Sorry, I'm now obviously getting lots of messages about the whole company stuff. Um, because there was a there was a feeling. In the early days when he was linked with Spurs, that perhaps it was a, a ploy, or not a ploy, but the noise was helpful for him to get a new contract at Burnley. Um, yeah, but we'll, well, good luck to him. Good luck to him. Another, uh, personally, I think I said this before, I felt it was a little bit early doors um, to, to kind of, I th kind of feel like for him, company, to be a Premier League manager now with the club that he's taken up to him is, is probably going to be the best experience he can get. Um, yeah, it did feel a little bit early in the journey for Spurs to kind of be leaping in there and trying to take him across. But I'm sure they, you know, well, I know they certainly did their research into him. But um, but yeah, yeah, there we go. I think there's some Hoybier quotes apparently floating around as well, which uh, be quite interesting. Let's have a look. I think Guest is telling me mid video that uh, he sent some. Okay. No, these are ones that are not for today. Not for today. So keep an eye out for that. Hoy Bier stuff tomorrow, um, which will be coming along. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, back to the game uh, and Mason. And I asked him exactly what he did with the uh, with the system uh, and kind of get to him to explain it to us exactly what he'd done. Uh, and this is what he said. He said... Ultimately, we wanted to um, engage Palace higher up the pitch because we know they have some individual brilliance and we wanted to avoid them getting the ball in our final third and in the box running at us. So we added a sixth man into the press and tried to be a bit more aggressive and I have to compliment the players because when you've been working in a certain way for so long, to make that change at this stage of the season, it's very positive uh, to me. And um, actually, Charlie Eccleshire from The Athletic, as we were... Um, 
heading out of the uh, the presser, he very quickly grabbed Mason and just said, "Oh, just out of interest, who is the sixth man?" Uh, and he was again. He looked at the his press officer as if to say, "Like, am I allowed to say this?" It's like, "Yes, you are. You're the manager." Um, and he said it was Pedro Porro. So, yeah, I mean, if, I guess if you just think of all the other attacking players there um, and the midfield, um, what's that? Yeah, well, yes, four four two essentially. If you look at it that way, it's it's the uh, the four and two were all able to press, whereas it had only been five previously, um, and it made a difference. It did. Spurs were very le- far less uh, doing that thing where they just drop deep into their own half. There was a lot more of the game was played halfway line just into the Palace half. Um, and that's that's what we want to see. We really do. Um, and he actually, yeah, he, he spoke a little bit further about the system in his Spurs play interview, which was quite an interesting one. He said, it's a similar sort of personnel to what we've had previously, but we just want to engage them high up the pitch with two strikers and more of a four-man defence because we know they've got some individual brilliance in the final third. So for us to try and limit people like Zaha, Elise and Eze getting on the ball in the final third was what we wanted to do, and I thought we did that. Obviously, the last five or ten minutes, naturally, when you haven't won in a while, becomes a bit of tension. Overall, I thought we were good value for the win and probably could have had one more with Sonny in the second half, but I'm very happy. Um, he said, I've got experienced people with me on the bench and I lean on them. We talk and I think in different games and different situations, you have to adapt because the teams in the Premier League are so good, so fluid and well organised. It's our job to help the players as much as possible. And I thought today, the little tweak we did, the players responded and they worked very hard. They deserved all the credit because we've asked them to do something they haven't done in a while. They responded, they were brave and ultimately we got the result. Speaks well, Mason. I do like um, his press conferences. He kind of treads this line between sometimes giving us absolutely nothing and feeling that everything has to stay in-house, which is fair. That's absolutely his right to do. Some people might agree with that as well. Um, But then also, sometimes he'll go the other way. Like I asked him a few questions about the youth setup as well. Um, And, yeah, he's, he's very good. When it's a subject that he feels it doesn't influence the match the next day, he's quite happy to go into it in some real analytical depth. And after games as well, looks like he does. Um, but yeah, no, no, we're going to talk about quite a bit about Ryan Mason uh, later on when we're talking about managerial stuff. Um, I do, uh, yeah, I find him an interesting young man. Young man. Um, Kane was pleased with the system as well. I wrote down some of his quotes as well. Um, it was good. I thought we got pressure high up the pitch. We weren't so camped in our half. Then with the ball, I felt we kept possession a bit better. We were a bit more patient, not forcing it forward too much. We were playing against a good side, so there weren't too many chances. But if you look at the whole game, we probably had the better ones. I can't remember Fraser making too many saves. Obviously, we're still working, and we've got another week now with Ryan to work again towards a really tough game against Villa. Yeah, I mean, Palace were quite well drilled. You know, what Roy Hodgson's going to bring, he is an old master in terms of, you know, he knows how to, to set up against other teams to counter some of the things that they will bring. Um, and, yeah, they they do what they do, don't they? They use those three very talented players to suddenly break, um, support, supporting IU as well. Um, but other than that, they very much sit in a very compact shape. And then it was down to Spurs to break them down, and they did. It was actually a really nice move, the goal as well. Um um, oh yeah, he was asked about um, having this full week of training under his belt and, and able to properly work on a lot of these little patterns of play and, and organisation with the players. And he said, absolutely, this week has helped. The first week after I took over, we had no time to work on a training pitch. It was just trying to get inside the players and create a different feeling inside the group. To have a week to actually get on the grass and work to try to help the players and give them new ideas and new stimulus, they all responded really well. Not only the starters, but also the whole squad. This training week has been very good, and when you get a result on the pitch, it fills the group with confidence. So yeah, this was his first win uh, in this spell as caretaker boss. Um, the mood inside the stadium did feel different. Bearing in mind, obviously, my comparison was, was pre um, the Mason era. When, before I went away, obviously, Newcastle was just completely different anyway. But, um, yeah, just judging it based on my last visit to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, I did feel... I wouldn't say the, the atmosphere was incredible, like this amazing, roaring thing behind the players, but I did feel it was a better 
atmosphere. I did feel before kickoff, you could really feel the cheers with every single player's name read out on the team sheet. I think you could sense... How do I put this? I know, obviously, the Spurs fans are frustrated. Of course they are. and They've got every right to be after this season. Um, but I did feel like... They were going to give this team a chance. I always got that impression. I never felt that they were ready to pounce on them for any mistakes and things like that. Um, yeah, there was no, there were no boos. There was nothing like that. There was obviously some brief leave you out chance from the south stand for a little while. Probably weren't as loud as before I went away, but they were there. They were there. And that's that's an important thing as well that they're still there. Um, but I did feel, yeah, overall. You know, we've used that word before, toxic and all that. I did feel like the crowd w were there to get behind the team. Um, and, and that may well be the Mason factor. You know, I think there's a lot of people that would like to see him do well. Um, and, and that in turn extends to the team. And I think the, I did think that the lineup helped as well. I do think it was, a, like I say, a crowd friendly lineup. And obviously a switch to a back four is what a lot of fans, I think, have wanted to see as well. Just not the one against Newcastle with Perisic being in there. Um, who is not a left back? Um, it's something to build on. It, it is. Um, I think the timing of Kane's goal helped as well. You know, just coming before half time, it kind of killed off a little bit of Palace's any momentum they might have been building, and it killed off any kind of thoughts of frustration among the Spurs fans. And they kind of came out for the second half in a in a good way. Um, and it's something for Mason to build on. You know, you must keep reminding yourself he's only thirty one years old. Most people are still playing at that age um, and you know obviously he would have been had it not been for the horrible thing that happened to him um, and yeah I mean you say, you look at his little spell at the moment draw against United only a last only lost to Liverpool with a last gasp goal um, and he's picked up a, a decent home win against an informed Palace side Palace have been in really good form you know it's uh, I don't think they lost the one before but other than that you know they were on a really good little run and they've swept themselves right up the table and away from any problems. So uh, I do wonder whether the Spurs fans out there, quite a few, are probably thinking, oh, why, is it wait? why did it wait this long to give Mason a little chance? You know, I like Christian Stellini. He's a lovely guy, but you do have to look back on it and wonder why Mason didn't get the gig straight away at that point. Um, I think there's a bit more to it, but we shall see whether time allows that to uh, be fully expanded upon and uh, yeah we'll see we'll see but um, one man made the difference really and it was Harry Kane King Kane on the day of the coronation um, I'm just so I just hate the thought of a Tottenham Hotspur without Harry Kane right now and it is something that unfortunately every time I see games like this it just makes me think of that when he's, it's another game where he's been the match winner. Um, it's just a kind of a vision, I think, a nightmarish vision that no Spurs fan surely ever wants to see. I'm going to call it the Apocane Lips. The Apocane Lips. Got to say it really quickly. Apocane Lips. Um, the bleak future where there is no Harry Kane at Tottenham Hotspur. I hope it's something that we don't have to see until he hangs up his boots. But with the club as it is, you know, it's 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 more and more difficult to try and kind of be positive about long term that happening. I still do have a stronger feeling that it'll be at the club next season. It's the one after. We'll see. We'll see. Who knows? Who knows what the next few months bring? Who knows how that shapes his thinking? Um, but yeah, I just I just don't really want to imagine. I don't want to imagine life without him. Uh, you know what I mean? It was another day where he scored the match-winning goal. It was another day where he sent more records tumbling around him. He is such an incredible player. He really is. And even the goal was just a perfect example of kind of how he's the beating heart of this Tottenham side through good and bad. Um, so the ball came from the back, didn't it? It was worked out to Ben Davies. Ben Davies hit a really... Hard but good pass infield, kind of dissecting pass. Kane took it on his left foot, teed it up for himself to then swivel it and knock the ball with his right foot out to the wing where he knew Porro was running down. Porro took a touch, flied a perfect cross in, 
Kane's ghosted and how they were not aware that he was there. He ghosts, that's what he does. His movement is so good and timed so well. And he heads it down into the wet grass, past Sam Johnson and into the goal. It was, yeah, it just said everything about Kane. And, and everything, the kind of a lot of the good stuff they did anyway came through him. He played a little one-two with Hoybier, which threaded this lovely pass into Hoybier's run, who unfortunately sliced it kind of high and wide. Um, and yeah, he, he fought hard for Mason as well. Um, track back, there was one really good clearance just in front of his own goal. Um, yeah, it was excellent. I, was, I mean, just look at his stats. I've got them down here. So that goal made it 26 Premier League goals this season from 35 matches. He's done that in, let's be honest, an inconsistent and often rubbish Tottenham team this season. He, 26 Premier League goals in 35 matches is ridiculous. And it is purely the fact that Erling Haaland um, has had you know, this remarkable season, 35 Premier League goals in 32 games. And that he's getting all the attention. And rightly, he's getting a lot of attention. He's an incredible striker. And I do feel like, because of what he's doing, what Kane's done in a lesser team with less chances created for him and around him has gone unnoticed. I just think he's so remarkable because maybe it's just people just expect Kane to score and it's, so it's not a big thing. Um, but, you know, and I've said this before probably, I don't think enough people wonder exactly what Kane would be doing this season in Haaland's shoes playing at that City side. Because I genuinely think he would have, you know, bear in mind, he's only nine goals behind him. You put him in City's side where they create so many chances in every game. I would go as far to say, not only does he score the same amount, I wonder if he might have scored more. I, we'll never know, hopefully. But I, I do think he would have matched what Haaland's done this season. I think that's, it's logical. I think if you look at that and you see that in nine, he scored nine goals less in a far, far worse team than, than City... Um, and far less attacking team this season as well than the City. I think you put him in that scenario. I think those nine goals are made up quite easily. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's not to do down Haaland. Haaland's absolutely brilliant. I love Erling Haaland. He's such, such a good player. Um, and I think he's only going to get better, which is quite scary as well for defences everywhere. But yes, more records. More records are broken. So, if you haven't seen these already... <laughs> With that goal, Kane became the first player ever to score 10 headed goals in a Premier League season. I think he overtook Duncan Ferguson, who had nine. He was also became the first player in the Premier League to net 100 goals at home and 100 goals away. Um, I think maybe he's got 109 away. I'm trying to remember what it was now. Oh, I can't remember the numbers. Uh, no, I think that's right. I think it's 109 away, 100 at home. So... If you're adding up, is good there. You'll have uh, worked out that he's now on 209 Premier League goals, which meant that he went past Wayne Rooney to become the second highest all-time Premier League goal scorer. That's insane. That is insane that only one man has scored more than him in the history of the Premier League because we know football was invented when the Premier League started, obviously. Um, yeah, and also worth pointing out, He's reached 209 goals in just 317 appearances. Rooney reached 208 in 491. <laughs> it's just mad. The numbers are mad. He's just a phenomenon, Kane. He really is such a wonderful player. So like I said, there's only one man now stands in his way to becoming the all-time top Premier League goal scorer. That is, of course, Alan Shearer. 260 goals, 441 appearances. So Kane has got their... One, oh God, there's some mass time coming. 100 and... <laughs> 124 games to score 51 goals in. Um, yeah, God, sorry. I've got so many numbers written down here. That was my brain just couldn't add up because there's about a million different ones on there. Um, that's my excuse anyway. Yeah. I just I, I, that is why he's not going to move abroad. If he moves abroad, that'd be madness, and I think everyone knows that. And he's shown, he said in the past he's got no real intention of moving abroad. So 
when you see him linked with the likes of Bayern Munich, you just think, what? <laughs> no way! He wants to be the all-time Premier League top goal scorer. Um, and I don't doubt he'll do it. I really don't. Uh, he's got this expression. Whenever Miles, the club journalist, asks him about records, he's just like, yep, on to the next one. So he said that again. There's a little laugh when he said it. Uh, he said, look, these are great. Really special achievements. It's hard to think about them, though, during the season. But to go second in the all-time list above Wayne is something I'm extremely proud of. I like to improve every season. So that headed goal one, the record, to find goals in different ways is important. I've just got to keep working, keep improving, and hopefully keep scoring goals. Um, and yeah, I think he was happy with the overall thing because what we mustn't forget as well is that he and Mason are really good friends. They are. Um, they came up through the academy, obviously a couple of years apart. Mason's about two years older than them. But they would have then, as they progressed, still played in a lot of the teams towards the upper levels of the academy. And then obviously broke into the first team at the same time. I think they both got into the England team at roughly the same time under Roy Hodgson as well. And they are very close. I think they still like holiday, or they certainly were before one was the boss, holiday together um, with their respective families. So, yeah. I think he, I think he was probably as happy to win the game for Ryan Mason as he was with the goal itself and the various records that it, it tumbled. Um, he said it was a really tough game off the back of the week we had, so to get the three points and a clean sheet is pleasing. We changed the system without the ball and it worked. We caused them a few problems with the ball um, as well, and we can be proud of the result. It was Ryan's first full week to work and train the team. We changed to a 4-4-2 without the ball to get the extra man, and then with the ball it was similar to our normal formation. It's nice to get on the score sheet, and when you win, it feels that little bit sweeper, uh, sweeper, sweeter. And yeah, Mason just hugely admires Kane. You can tell um, he sees him as, and I don't think he's far wrong, the kind of pinnacle for players to want to be like. Because he is, you won't see Harry Kane, you know, in the newspapers for doing anything iffy off the pitch. Uh, he is very much a guy. He's about his family and he's about working incredibly hard. Likes his golf, and that's kind of it. You know, he just wants to improve himself. And he's made lots of sacrifices in his life to make sure that he does that. Um, and so, yeah, Mason, when he's talking about it, it's clear in his voice. He said, I think we can sit here all day and speak about Harry. Naturally, people see the goals, the records, but probably what doesn't get touched upon enough is the individual brilliance from a technical point of view. Most importantly, the team player, the humility. He's humble. He works hard. He fights for the team. He's recovering. He's working back. He's an example of any young player to see a top player and how to act. We're very lucky to have him. We know that. We feel it every day. Um, and he was asked, it was an interesting question. He, he was asked, what changes has he seen over the years, obviously having been alongside Kane since such a young age. Uh, he said, that's a difficult one. So I don't think I've seen a great deal of change in terms of the person, the mindset, the elite mindset, the desire to keep working hard and improve. Naturally, I think we'll all talk about Harry's goals and when he plays games of football, he will continue to score goals. We know that. But it's that elite mindset, that example that he sets every day in and around the place. It's great to be around because when you have people like that, they inspire you to be better. We appreciate Harry and we value him so highly at this football club. Um, yeah, he didn't want to look ahead though, Mason, to, to Shearer and that record, um, I guess because of his own, well, exactly this, this will say, because of his personal experiences. I don't like speaking too much about the future because from personal experience, you can't plan too far ahead in football terms and in life. You've got to be in the moment. Harry is certainly one player who's focused in every game and he gives the best version of himself every time he's out on the football pitch, whether it's on a training ground or match day. Hopefully Harry continues to play and I'm sure he'll continue to score goals. Um, and yeah, he loved the fact that Kane popped up and, and uh, cleared the ball in front of his uh, his own area, uh, in front of his own goal. He said the Premier League is tough. To win games in the Premier League is difficult and you have to have 11 players that are fighting for each other and working hard as a collective to get results. When you've got your captain, your leader, your goal scorer, probably one of the best players setting that example, that's what I want. That's what any manager or coach wants. It probably doesn't get spoken about enough in terms of his overall performances because we put a lot of attention on his goals and those goal-scoring records, but he's a joy to watch. In this country, we should really appreciate him because he's a special, special player. And So, so yeah, <clears throat> it was somewhat apt that, um, you know, they were playing against Roy Hodgson's team and Roy Hodgson gave Harry Kane his England debut and he gave Ryan Mason his England debut. I think, if I'm not wrong I think Mason Hodgson 
maybe the oldest and youngest, or youngest and oldest managers in the Premier League right now, I think. But yeah, it was quite fitting because obviously then Hodgson was able to talk about Kane afterwards. Um, if you don't remember Harry Kane's England debut, he came on against Lithuania. I think he scored within 80 seconds. Of course he did. Um, Hodgson said, he always scored in my four years previously at Palace. A real talent of a goal, as in today, from a transitional situation. The way he got the ball and volleyed it into that space. We know how good he is in the air and he showed it again. His moment of brilliance won the game. He's a fine player. What he has done for this club has been enormous. Since he made his debut for England when we were with the England team, he's gone from strength to strength. He's still a young man and I'm pretty certain Alan Shearer needs to be concerned because Harry will be breathing down his neck. I would think that the only things that stand between him and the record will be, is he going to avoid serious injury? Is he going to be able to get to 20 to 30 matches a year behind him? Uh, is he going to help get help from his teammates and play in a good team? If all of those things take place, I would expect him to break the record absolutely. I think he will. I think he will. I just pray it's at Spurs. I really hope it is. Um, yeah, I really hope so. But yeah, look, while obviously Harry Kane made the difference attacking-wise, um, although neither of them particularly did, obviously Sonny had that big chance. It was a great run. If he just tried to round Sam Johnson, it was very good from the goalkeeper, to be fair. He got these fingertips to it. But what I would say about both Son and Richarlison, that while maybe they didn't make the impact they would have wanted attacking-wise, defensively they were superb. Um, the work they did for the team, both of them. Uh, Richarlison kept tracking back down the right-hand side a lot. There was one moment we did this, him and Emerson kind of ganged up on, I think it was IU, and he did this um, lovely, like, it was almost, I think Dan from the Evening Standard said, it, it was like a JJ Okocha scoop, and he put it over IU, and IU ended up pulling both Richardson and Emerson back, earning himself a yellow card in the process to try and keep up. And Sonny worked his absolute socks off. Um, he was constantly chasing back down the left, helping out Ben Davies, um, and interestingly, while he's, you know, he and Perisic have maybe shared corner duties in the past, he had a very set role that you could see in this one that was that every time Palace took a, um, sorry, every time Spurs had an attacking corner, Sonny was kind of hanging around the edge of the Palace box, ready to either get the ball, but also ready to shoot back in the opposite direction to try and keep up with the, the pacey Palace attackers if they counted. And that's, you know, that's a tough ask of one of the Premier League's best attackers. Uh, oh, by the way, can you also be ready to kind of be the guy that tracks back and and, and runs and uh, you know keeps up with the attackers going in the other direction? Um, and he, he did it superbly. To be fair to him, um, I remember he made one really really good header to stop. Uh, and it's not header's not something we associate with Sonny, but it was a terrific defensive header to stop the ball going behind him. I think it was. Elise getting behind him. Um, he did so well, Sonny. And I've seen, you know, I understand the frustration. I've seen, especially Korean fans, have like, well, why? Why are you making one of your most attacking talents track back and defend? But I do think that in even a lot of the best teams in the world, every player defends, every player is a team player. Um, and, you know, and fair play to Sonny for being able to do it, honestly. I, th I thought he was. Uh, I thought that side of his game was so good yesterday, um, yeah. which was fantastic to see what an all-round player he is as well. I think Harry Kane spoke about it. I've got it here. He said, full credit to Ryan and the staff. It was his first full week to really work in trainers. He changed the system a little bit without the ball, but without, without the ball and with, with the ball to keep more possession. Set pieces are a big part of the game, so he knew that Sonny's pace would keep up with some of their counter-attacking pace. Credit to him. He stuck with it and he made a couple of important headers there at the back. From front to back, everyone was determined to keep a clean sheet and that's important going football. And when Mason was asked about Son and, and how important he was also defensively, he said that's how you win games of football. And we've been banging on about that for the past 10 days or so. That We have to be together in every moment. Naturally, the attacking players will score more goals and get the plaudits from an attacking point of view. But when you work as a team, you fight for each other and you show you're committed for each other. I think the fans can appreciate that time of action as well. Uh, to see a player like Sonny and Harry and Richie, players of their size and stature, tracking back, recovering, fighting, running for the team. That's what we want to see. And it's true. All three players. You know, Sonny did a lot of great work. But, you know, like I said, you had Harry Kane tracking back, making that clearance in his own box. 
Richarlison getting back down the right to help out Emerson and Porro as well with the with the threat that Palace had down that side. Um, yeah, Zaha. I like Zaha a lot in terms of what he can do. He is one of the moaniest people on a football pitch I've ever had to witness. Um, I'd imagine a lot of that is probably born of the frustration of probably being kicked quite a lot when he gets past people. But my goodness, he moans. And he gets involved in so many little kind of tussles with people and and kind of, I think he, he likes to do like quite a lot of pushing, and then they push him back, and that aggravates him. And sometimes, obviously, it must happen the other way as well. He gets pushed and pushes back. But yeah, he is, he's a moaner. He is certainly a moaner, but he's a very talented moaner, Zaha. He really is. What he can do with the ball, if he just had a little bit more of an end product, um, I do think he would still be playing, you know, no disrespect to Palace, but I, I think he would have continued at the level. You know, they were hoped for him when he was at United. Um, I think he would be... You know, I'm intrigued to see where he goes this summer. You'd, you'd imagine maybe abroad. Obviously, he's going to be a free agent. Um, who knows? Maybe Tottenham finally do actually look at him as a potential signing. I don't know. I wonder if his age might count against him and the money he'll be able to ask for. Um, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, um, they did well, Spurs attackers. Another set of players that did well was that right hand side we kind of hinted at it earlier um emerson royale emerson royale wow um let's start with the, the little press conference a little the press conference ahead of the game when i actually came out of it foolishly saying to the other journalists oh he's, he's much better than stellini with his injury news ryan isn't he he uh you know he uh He's quite honest with you and he tells you in detail what's happened because we found out that Hugo Lloris and Ryan Session are out for the season. Um, I was like, okay, right, well, that, that's that's new. Um, and he spoke about the other players. Um, and what he said about Emerson Royal, he said, Emerson, I think it's, it's a day-to-day -day check on how he is and how he's coping. Hopefully Emerson can help us between now and the end of the season. Yeah, he did. The next day he started. <laughs> it was like proper subterfuge there from uh, Ryan Mason. It was, yeah, Emerson was already in raring to go, clearly. Um, straight back, fair play to him. It was, when was his surgery? Was it end of February? I think he's been out for at least two months. Where are we in? No, March. Maybe it was March. March, April. I feel like it's about two months he's been out and he slipped straight back into that team and did very well. Obviously, being um, often the right-sided of the three of centre-backs, probably a less um, physically knackering role than the wing-back role he was playing. But still, I thought he did so well again. Um, so, yeah, so he was straight back in. Um, it was March. March, sorry, his knee surgery. I've got it written down here. Then it was Yves Basuma. Uh, Mason said of him... I think, yeah, no, I asked about Basuma. He said, there are obviously some hurdles he's got to overcome and to hit certain goals, but we're hopefully he'll appear before the end of the season. I'm guessing those hurdles were breakfast and tying up his shoelaces, his bootlaces, because he was on the bench. He didn't come on, but he was on the bench, which was a little bit of a surprise for everyone involved. Bear in mind, it's three months after having ankle surgery, but there you go. That's fine. Ryan Mason wants to, you know, keep things to himself. He has every right to do that. Um... But yeah, I did. Uh, I did think the Emerson Porro move worked perfectly. That was one of probably the biggest successes on the day because um, it was. It's a great way of getting the best out of Emerson and Porro while also limiting the exposure of their weaker sides of the game. So it's less defending for Porro to do while he adapts and adjusts to the Premier League, and it also means that Emerson doesn't have to get up the end of the pitch and wonder what he does when he gets in that final third. It, Yeah, it was good. I, thought, I, I really like the way that worked. And, uh, yeah, I think I've got some quotes here as well. I actually got some stats. Actually, let's first off just say how well Emerson did against Zaha. You know, I was just talking about Zaha and everything he brings. And Emerson, I'd say he probably won his fair share of the tussles with Zaha as well. Zaha kept having to come inside to, to try and shake him off. Um, and like I say, got more and more frustrating. I've got Emerson stats, two tackles, two interceptions, three clearances. Yeah, and he lasts a full 95 minutes after two, more than two months out. Uh, Mason said about him afterwards on Emerson, he was outstanding. I thought the whole team without the ball worked hard. They worked together and obviously Emmy had a period out, but I trust him. Emmy, haven't heard that nickname before. 
Uh, we trust him. I thought today he did a very good job along with the rest of the players on the pitch. When you keep a clean sheep, sheep. <laughs> when you keep a clean sheep, you've got to wash your sheep. When you keep a clean sheet, it's a collective. It's everyone, and everyone fought for the clean sheet. The players on the pitch, but also the ones who didn't, because in the training week, we've worked, all worked hard together, and they're the results you want. I just love the Emerson journey, because he's gone from like fans' boos, cheers. Honestly, like even before the game, when they read out the teams, he got one of the loudest cheers for being in there. It's like one of the happy things from this season has been the way he's transformed his his season, his Tottenham time around. And he's just done it through sheer will, persistence and determination. You know, I think a lot of fans wanted him gone. I think the management wanted him gone at some point. But he was not having it. He was going to stick around. And it, it may end up being a great thing, not only for him but, and the club. You know, if in a back four... I think he's a very good right back. I've always said this. I think it was always the fact that they were kind of squashing him into a wing back role. It didn't really suit him. Whereas now, I, you know, and I think we've all suggested before, or certainly some of us have, that maybe on the right of the back three, we actually would be would suit him as well. And lo and behold, here he was again, looking good in that role. Um, you know, they may have found the system for the end of the season, and, and who knows beyond. Um, and yeah, it was good for Porro. Having the foundation of Emerson behind him, doing everything he does, it gave Porro the chance to just go off and, and just do what he does best. You know, he took some really nice set pieces, actually, with Perisic out. He sent in the corner that Romero headed against the crossbar. He sent in another couple that were really dangerous as well. Delivered that perfect cross to Kane to head home as well. And that defective shot tipped over the crossbar at the last second by Johnson as well. Worked really hard in the press, like we said, as that sixth man doing that. Um, tracked back a lot. Um, no, he did really well. Um, he Kane said of him after, Pedro is fantastic. He's got a great delivery. As he looked up, I think he just saw me there at the back post with a bit of space. Perfect ball. And I timed my header well. And with the zip off the surface... Uh, it was nice to see it bouncing. I think he showed great desire without the ball today. We know what he can do with the ball, but without the ball, he showed great desire against a really tough winger. Um, obviously, Zaha. Mason said on him, Pedro has been quite effective, quite effective for us, even in the previous system. He scored goals. He's created chances. He's a good guy. He works hard. He fights for the team. And I thought we saw that today. He's affected the game today with and without the ball. That was the job and the task that we set him. I'm very pleased. Very pleased with his performance for the team because we saw a desire to help his teammates from a defensive point of view, but also, sorry, teammate, technically, he said, but also not losing that attacking threat that we wanted him to give us. And he's been part of a clean sheet for the group, but also got the assist for Harry, which is good for him. Um, yeah, and it'd be intriguing now to see whoever is the manager going forward after this season, how they utilise Porro and Emerson because the very differing nature of their abilities, uh, their skill sets. Actually, if you've got a back four and you can kind of develop Porro's defensive side, and he will adjust to the Premier League, you've got two very interesting kind of different right backs there. And then you've also got Jed Spencer as well, a very raw talent who can be developed too. So, yeah, I'm intrigued to see what happens with that right back role. That That's a, that's a, a fierce battle there. For um yeah, for for everyone involved really. Um so yeah, it's good to see. That was a good good decision by Mason as well. Another good decision by him. Um There's something about Ryan Mason. There is. There is something about him. Uh he's got that presence. Even when he was twenty nine, I think I probably would have said this at the time. Uh even when he was twenty nine, I remember twenty twenty one, taking the team for the first time, winning four of those last six Premier League games. He just had this thing about him, this ability to to have that air of authority, despite the fact that he was younger than probably a lot of the players or quite a few of the players he was coaching. Um, and obviously a very keen tactical mind. I think we're seeing that in these three games. We've seen little tweaks and changes during the games against Man U and Liverpool that I think really helped Spurs. And we've seen you know, some big changes against Palace that really set them up for the win as well. It's done very well. Because obviously we're two years on from that experience before. Got his pro licence in January. Worked worked hard to get that. Um, and it just I think that's given him a lot more confidence, even in his own ability as well. 
uh, to back up that authority that he probably always had. Players always speak glowingly of his training sessions, as they did back in 2021 as well. Um, I saw a Hoybier quote actually earlier from a couple of days ago where he was saying about, it's the old cliche, but it doesn't matter how old you are if you're good enough. And he said that certainly applies to Ryan Mason. Um, yeah, I mean, the players rave about his training sessions and how kind of clever and tactically in, involved and detailed they are. Um, obviously Conte, who remember me telling you this, Conte was really impressed. That first day he arrived at Spurs, his work permit hadn't arrived, so he had to kind of work as an observer. Um, and he was so impressed with Mason, that was why he asked to bring him on his coaching staff. That was not a Spurs recommendation. He wanted to bring him in, and Mason had actually said no before to joining Nuno's team, but but Conte wanted him. Um, yeah, yeah, there's something about him. I mean, that's now five Premier League victories as a acting head coach. That's more than some managers out there have got. I mean, old uh, Frank de Boer at Palace, did he even get one? I can't remember. I don't think he did. Um, yeah, you know, he's got a better record than, than, than quite a few of them probably out there as well. Poor old Christian Cellini among them. Um, yeah, like I say, it's 10 days. When you look back at his 10 days or so, so far, point against United in a stadium that could have been a really difficult atmosphere and they went behind, but he got them back uh, and, you know, he, he was dealing with a defence that's confidence was on the floor. And he got them back to a 2-2 draw there. Again, you saw the, the, the confidence drained from that defence at Liverpool. Yet again, a little bit of tweak of the system. I think he went to... Obviously, this is one I didn't see, but I saw the kind of end result. I think he went to 3-5-2, didn't he? Uh, they roared back into that, came back 3-3. And then obviously it was just a, a misplaced Lucas pass from, from getting another point there. And then he's actually fixed the defence this week and made a big decision. Yeah, this is a whole thing. I say whole thing. Some people had this thing about him, didn't they, when he was just a 29-year-old. Oh, he only picks his mates. Um, I think I said this in the last video. That meant the players he wasn't picking were the likes of Tongi on the melee. They were the Joe Rodens, who unfortunately, for one reason or another, are not playing for Spurs right now. So that wasn't a Ryan Mason thing. But yeah, yesterday took out Eric Dyer. You know, Eric Dyer was not in the team. That shows that he's not going to be kind of withholden to these players that would used to be his teammates. It's not like he plays his mates kind of thing. I don't think it does work like that. I always felt that was a bit of a eh, thing back then. Um, and yeah, this was another example of why it didn't really make sense. Um, but no, I think he's done well. I think he's done well again. Um, he's made no secret of the fact that he wants the job. Um, he feels he's ready. Um, you know, and he'll say that he's should he's got a bit of a head start on all the other candidates because he knows the club so well inside out. Um, particularly somebody inexperienced, you know, Vincent Company. We were just saying about him signing his new contract, and uh, he was certainly one that you know obviously struggled at Anderlecht in the top flight and the only top flight kind of club he'd been at before as a manager. Um, and he's obviously done incredibly well in the Championship. Don't get me wrong, but experience wise, you know. It's not a million miles ahead of where Ryan Mason is. And like I say, Ryan Mason will say, well, yeah, but I know this club. And that also gives me a lot more experience than a lot of these people. Um, while I was away, he was asked, um, oh, actually, just uh, just to say here um, about the fans and Mason, I do feel like I think there's, there, there's more of them now uh, that would be more convinced about him, more... Um, how do I put it? More convinced that he, he's got enough about him. To, I mean, you know, he's taken on Ten Hag, Klopp, and Hodgson. Three, well, certainly one of the a, a real kind of managers that everyone's been lauding this season in Ten Hag, and Klopp and Hodgson, two of the most experienced tacticians out there. Um, and he has not embarrassed himself in any way, shape, or form. He's made decisions in all of those matches against them that have actually put all three of those managers' teams on the rack. Um, you know, because you look at it, the United Liverpool. Games. Spurs fans have seen probably better attacking play than a lot of the stuff they'd seen previously this season. Um, and as we said, the game yesterday, his first clean sheet since February. So he's bringing something to the job. He's definitely doing something behind those closed doors. And while I was away, he was asked about whether he wanted his job full time. Um, he said, yeah, obviously I'm ready. And if that situation happens, it obviously means I've done a good job. 
but it's obviously in the future, four, five, six weeks' time. I've never doubted my personal ability because I've worked hard for the last six years, spending many hours on the grass and coached a lot to get a good understanding of it. At the same time, I like seeing young managers do well, and probably more so young English managers, because I think the route for us is probably quite difficult at times. I think this was because he was asked about other young managers in the game. He said, it's part of football. The more younger managers we get is good and exciting for people, but at the same time, you've got to get results. That's the business. If you don't get results, unfortunately, it becomes difficult. And do you know what? He's not a meek presence on that touchline. He's not a guy that just is, is there to kind of, uh, you know just be this kind of young coach on the sideline he gets very angry gets very involved um you could see he was Klopp said that kind of patronizing stuff about him after Liverpool game like oh you know he should he's got other things to worry about and like the style of football Klopp's always going on about Spurs style of football probably because Liverpool often struggle against Spurs and he doesn't like that he's like could you please turn up and play in the way we want you to play so we can beat you easily it's like it's a really weird mindset I like Klopp I think a lot of the things he does and says that are really good, but he's just got this real block sometimes when teams... I think Guardiola is maybe better at this. He occasionally does a bit of a Klopp in that respect. But I do feel like between the two managers, Klopp it just has this issue with teams that give them problems. and He doesn't like it if you don't play in the way, the kind of football he wants to play. But yeah, um, Ryan Mason was asked about that in midweek um, or Friday in the presser. And he was like, you can see he wanted to kind of snap back. But he was just very much respectful. So I really respect Klopp. But, uh, and I don't see, I think I'll ever be in a position where I can criticise another club and the way they play kind of thing. It was so, it was like one of those read between the lines things. Uh, but yeah, he's not a quiet guy on the touchline. He shouts, he screams, he he tries to get his point across. I say screams, that's too much. He shouts, he, he gets his point across. And, and there was a moment late on when Clement Longley... Um, kind of sacrificed his shoulder for the team. Um, I think it was Zaha trying to get through. Um, and Longley kind of put his arm out to try and stop it. He'd like, fallen to the floor and he put his arm out to stop him. And you could see his shoulder went properly like, I don't know whether it was dislocated. It didn't look very nice. But what happened was they were, that obviously gave, he got a yellow card for that. And they, they were going to, um, Palace had a free kick from it. Mason went absolutely ballistic at the physios bringing Longley off because in his head he's thinking well I we we cannot be a center back down at this point we can't do that you know we had to kind of make it so that he stays on the pitch and then maybe they make the sub that way you know um we replace him that way as it was they kind of got away with it because the referee for one reason or another, I allowed them to make the change. And they brought on Dyer, and they actually brought on Dan Juma for Son, and that was when Son went round, and unfortunately had the absolutely rubbish thing happen to him. Um, but yeah, he was furious. And, and Longley, it was interesting because Longley was furious as well, and I'm not entirely sure why. I don't know whether he thought Mason was shouting at him for coming off, or whether he was just really annoyed that he had to come off because he didn't think he was that injured. I don't know, but certainly it wasn't like he was not moving his arm. And he went straight down the tunnel, which essentially did show with the physios that like, took him down there as if uh, it was serious enough that it needed that. I think I think we'll all be hoping that it's not serious enough to keep him out of kind of the Villa game and onwards, because, like I say, I like that balance in that, that uh, central defensive duo. But, uh, yeah, he was, he was not happy, Ryan Mason, at all. Um... He's kind of, he's doing what he needs to do right now. He's shifted the mood inside the club, which let's be honest, if you saw my face in the last video before I went, I needed that break. I needed six days away from everything pretty much Tottenham Hotspur. Um, and I'd imagine the, probably the players and the staff and a lot of the fans were like that as well. Um, and I feel like he has shifted it. I feel like he's shifted the mood outside as well. I certainly, I can only judge myself, I can't get myself into other people's minds, but I uh, certainly went to that game yesterday kind of thinking, you know, I think Spurs might do this. I think he's he's got them playing in a certain way, which actually ended up being a different way to how they played. But, yeah, I, I, I like Ryan Mason. I want to see him do well. Um, and, yeah, like I say, he's not duty-bound to any players. He will make these tough decisions. Um and on Saturday, he was asked an interesting question. I can't remember if it was in the Spurs play one or not. But he was asked whether he was aware that his 
team selections kind of have to also excite the fan base. And he said, I'm very aware of it. I was a player here. I always felt what it was like to play in the stadium with our fans. The club has a history, a certain DNA, a certain expectation. But for me, I'm realistic as well. When you don't have enough time to really change too much, it's about trying to stimulate the players and create a new feeling for everyone in this stadium, the fans, the players, everyone. You also have to be aware that when you don't have too much time, it's hard to change too much. I thought, though, that we could see a difference today, and we did. The training week has been good, and ultimately we're here to win games of football, and we did that today. Um, look, if Mason goes out there and he wins the last three games of the season, I do think more fans will continue to warm to the idea of maybe him taking on the job permanently, but I just feel like it still might not be enough to push him up that pecking order enough. Um I think it would certainly put him in the position where I don't think people would go ballistic. They would be absolutely outraged if he got the job. Uh, you know, some might see it as, uh, you know, maybe being Spurs' version of Arteta, although he's about 10, I think he's exactly 10 years younger than Arteta. Um, I just think the problem is, it's essentially there for Daniel Levy is the problem. Um, because obviously, like I said, there were chance against him again. On Saturday, I think he knows he has to make a bit of a statement with both the appointment of his manager, his head coach, but also director of football. Um, and I just worry that while I don't think a fair few people would be a totally against Ryan Mason becoming next manager, I feel like there would be enough people that would feel that it's like a, a cheap, unambitious move by Levy. And I think that's probably going to be Mason's biggest problem if he wants a job, is that he would be seen as a backup option rather than the obvious option, if you see what I mean. Um, I still maintain maybe it's slightly too early for him anyway. I personally... I would like to see him kind of do what Burnley, uh, Burnley, do what company's done at Burnley and go somewhere and really be able to put his stamp on it uh, and build an exciting team. But obviously that also comes with the risk, doesn't it? That comes with the risk that we've seen with the likes of Lampard and Gerrard going elsewhere and, and kind of spluttering eventually and it not working, although Lampard actually was at Chelsea twice. Um and whereas with Mason, maybe the best chart, most best place for him to excel is at Tottenham, a club that he knows inside out. It may be that whoever comes in next, he maybe thinks, well, I am only 31. Maybe I can have another season or two learning and continue to learn. But I just get the sense he feels he's ready. Uh, I think he will. And, you know, it may be that he stays at Spurs while going off and doing some interviews with other clubs. Um, I'd imagine he'd interview quite well as someone that's had to ask him a fair few questions when the first spell and now um, in the last couple of uh, days. You can see someone who's not phased by answering questions. And, I, and at, analytically, he's very good. Um, tactically, you know, he'd be able to talk through what he wants to do. Um, also quite realistic. You know, he was asked about the academy the other day and, and whether if he went to any club, how important the academy would be to him. And he didn't, just because he's an academy man, he didn't immediately go, oh, yeah, it's all it's the be-all and end-all. He was actually quite realistic. Like, it depends on the situation and where you're at and everything. Um, yeah, he's a very thoughtful guy. You can clearly see what's happened to him in his life and he's had to reevaluate everything. Um, and he's, yeah, he's obviously had a lot of time to think about everything. Um, he's a, a thoughtful chap. So, yeah, so we shall see what happens with the managerial stuff because, obviously, Spurs are now at the, the stage where they're starting to set up to talk to people that are in jobs because those seasons are coming to an end for various candidates. Um, you know, they've obviously have spoken to ones who aren't in jobs, you know, Julian Nagelsmann, although it is really interesting because we kind of know... That the club have spoken, whether it's through intermediaries or not, that they have spoken to various managers thus far. But my goodness, are they right now proactively shooting down everything they can, shooting down discussions taking place, the fact that there's any leading candidate. Honestly, everything they're saying right now, and I mean proactively, sometimes before they're even asked, saying, oh, inaccurate, this isn't true. Uh, especially with Julian Nagelsmann, uh, Xabi Alonso as well. Um, everything that comes out is like, no, it's not true. And I do, <laughs> I wonder whether there's, there's an element of trying to dampen expectations after what happened with that absolute farcical 2021, when obviously 
they did talk to a lot of different managers um, but they don't blame the media. It's like, no, no, we know. We know you spoke to them. Um, I don't know whether it's just dampening those expectations or maybe even just, just because the, the any chats they've had maybe haven't progressed exactly as they liked. It could be anything. Uh, it could be a combination of both. Um, I think it's just, yeah, the fear that if they miss out on someone, like even the company stuff, I haven't looked because I'm doing this, but I would imagine that there's probably some people out there going, oh my God, Spurs have missed out on company. When, like I said, I I, I, I don't know whether they were always, um, you know, whether whether he was the top candidate at any point or not. Um, like I say, it was, for me, felt a bit of a gamble. Did feel a bit of a gamble. But uh, for me, I'm... <laughs> Again, if I as a moment I see this, I could just hear like someone at Tottenham in the in the background going, "No, it's not true." But uh, for me, it feels like Nagelsmann is, it would be the is the logical top choice. Of course, of course, he's got to be. He ticks every box they want. He is the glamour appointment. He is the young project manager. He is someone that will excite a lot of those Spurs players, and he's not going to have the the egos that he had at Bayern to deal with as well. Um, so for me. It, makes little sense not to yeah he's got a bit of an ego himself and i'd imagine you know he want things in a certain way but uh yeah I, I just i just find it quite funny when they're kind of proactively denying stuff right now and, and i think it is i think it is to keep the the fan base from going absolutely mad at them um and interesting another thing they denied because i i'd heard that and i was told this by a couple of people that they um Levy, because obviously he hasn't got that guiding voice now with Paratici. Paratici was one of the few people that could actually tell Daniel Levy what to do. It's not that he listened every time, but he could tell him what to do. And now he doesn't have that voice. He doesn't have a director of football type. You know, we've seen the photo with Scott Munn. So clearly, Scott Munn, although again, Spurs deny this, he starts on July the 1st, officially. But we're told, we're led to believe by Tottenham that he is not working until July the 1st. I think we all know that of course he'll be consulted and he'll be certainly involved in certain aspects because they can't do things that wouldn't sit right with him. It would be awful business sense to do that. And we know that Fabio Paratici was working way before he was meant to start on July the 1st. We know that because he ripped up the shortlist. Um, so yeah, so without that real guiding voice from a very experienced football person in terms of you know the Premier League and European football which obviously Scott Munn isn't um I was told that Levy had been getting some advice from the Sportsology Group which if you're not aware who they are they're run by executive chairman uh, Mike Ford who helped co-found them Mike Ford used to be the uh director of football operations at Chelsea for six years during the times when they were they were winning lots of stuff uh, Sportsology were help, accredited with helping United hire Ten Hag last season. Um, they, they they kind of go into sports clubs and companies and try and kind of maximise whatever they want them to do, whether that be drawing up a list of recruits, whether it be doing due diligence or research on people, I don't know. But like I say, stress this because before it, I don't want it to go in aggregator stuff because I, I should stress, and I wrote this in a piece the other day, Spurs have absolutely categorically denied any suggestion that Sportsology have helped or advised Daniel Levy or Spurs in any way. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was quite interesting that I'd heard that. But Spurs are very much, again, um, putting that out there. So, um, so yeah, we now kind of see who these candidates will end up being. Personally, I feel like you're probably looking at uh, Nagelsmann I think Alonso will definitely be one of the candidates I think you're looking at Slot Amrim and who am I forgetting I still wouldn't entirely discount Roberto De Zerbi but I still think it would be very hard to convince him to come away from Brighton who is such a club on the up right now um, there will be others that will come into the frame others that may come back into the frame you know there's a the whole Luis Enrique thing which I find fascinating for me you know my views. I don't, It doesn't excite me as, as any of those names I've just said. Um, but there's no getting away from the fact that he's a glamour appointment. Um, and he is someone who has won stuff. And we know Daniel Levy likes those, regardless of whether they actually fit the club or not. Um, and, you know, and there's certain people. Guesty, who I do the podcast, Golden Guest Talk Tottenham with. He 
loves Andrew Postacoglu. He thinks he's fantastic. I think he's just won the title with Celtic, hasn't he? Um, you know, he's 57, so he's not exactly one of those young project managers. But I just wonder whether it's those those original list that I said there before Enrique and uh, Postacoglu that will be the ones that maybe they'll focus on. But there could be someone else that pops into the running because you know you're now dealing with very like Paratici. I know his shortlist before uh, contained Luis Enrique, Nagelsmann, De Zerbi, and I think Sergio Conceição is another one that he really likes as well. Obviously, Paratici is gone. And Spurs themselves have this very clear kind of, it feels like they're at a stage where they want to kind of go towards a, a younger project manager, which would make the Lewis Enrique, if they made a sudden directional shift there, that would make that weird. Um, and obviously we know about Richard Pochettino, but I can't go there. It's too distressing. We can't go there. Nagelsmann, he will come with a big cost by the sounds of it. It doesn't sound like, even at the in the summer, that he'll be... Um, cheap in any way, shape or form. It's quite interesting though because I've seen some people going, but how can that happen if he's been sacked? It's because he hasn't been sacked. He's been placed on gardening leave, which is a very different thing. It's because Bayern Munich knew very well that with a coach of his ability he was very unlikely to spend too much time sitting there on the shelf and they weren't going to have, they would just pay his monthly wages. You know, they don't want to have to pay off the rest of his contract. They knew that someone would come in and the suggestion seems to be um, that it would be more than 10 million this summer to get him. But what I'd say to that, Spurs would not hesitate to buy a, a half decent player for that. You know, we've looked, I think that roughly would be the price of Clement Longley, which I still think if you're Spurs and you're looking at that as a squad player, Clement Longley for about 10 million pounds, I think that's actually a really good deal. Um, but it also depends because if you want to bring in, I guess, your left sided centre back uh, and get a really big one this summer then obviously you've got him and Davies. So I don't know whether... We'll see what happens with them. But my point is, you could, would easily spend £10 million on a half-decent player. Why would you not pay that for a hugely influential figure that is going to be your... You want to be your next manager who you know could essentially bring you long-term success for, for many years to come and set up decades of success? Who knows? I just think there's this weird thing in football, isn't it? Where it's like, ooh, they've got to pay this fee, this get-out fee for him. And it's a bit like, and they've got big wages as well. It's like, but you don't even think twice when you do that for players. Like four times that amount. So why does it a manager who's probably more important than any player could ever be? I, well, I don't get why it's a thing. It's very strange. So the suggestions in Germany, you'll have seen the reports this week, seem to be that he's certainly... There's an interest from Nagelsmann um, in, how do I put this, awakening a dormant giant in Tottenham. Um, not my words. Um, let's be honest, if you're going to be a bit cynical, his, you know, his other options, alternatives, have lessened in recent weeks. There's, <laughs> there's certainly less uh, jobs out there for him to go to now. So that, that's going to naturally make Spurs all the more attractive. Um, and that's kind of what Spurs didn't want, but hey, sometimes you just got to roll with it if it is the right man. Um, but yes, a lot of certainly the reports in Germany suggesting that he would need reassurances over the ability of Spurs to challenge at the top. We've heard that before, and also who the sporting director would be that comes in, the director of football, because obviously, for especially for a younger manager, that's even more important. Um, he wants to just kind of concentrate on being the head coach, but also, I guess he wants a relationship with someone that he can get what he wants I guess you know someone that he, he knows it is not going to just do what they want rather than what he wants um so yeah so yeah but there's not, Alonso's an interesting one because he's six years older than Nagelsmann but actually he's far less experienced far is far more of a gamble um he's only been a first team manager since October which is like this is why I think when Ryan Mason sees people like Xavi Alonso he's probably like uh hello He's really thinking, you know, how is he like, way more experienced than me? Um, he's been in charge uh, at Bayer Leverkusen for just 32 matches. And, and to be fair to him, he's done a terrific job. He's swept them up the league from the lower reaches. He's got them in the semi-finals of Europa League, I think it is, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, he's obviously doing very well. But his only previous experience was, um, it was with Real Sociedad B 
and he took them, he got them promoted, and then he got them, he was with them when they got relegated again, and I think he left after that. But look, he, he, you know, very highly thought of, talented uh, young coach. He favours a 3-4-3 formation, so you'd be seeing a lot more of that if he were to be the man. Um, probably be the cheapest option as well. You know, for all the talk about Mason being a cheap option, Alonso technically would as well. I think he's only got a contract till 24, so yeah, he, he wouldn't cost too much either. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's an interesting candidate. Arne Slot, you know, what I think about Arne Slot, I really like the idea of him the more I read about him. Um, and he will become highly recommended by, I've said before, Levy's got some advisors in the, in the Dutch market as well. So he will come highly uh, recommended by them. And like I said before as well, correcting the error the Ten Hag era, leaving him hanging and not pushing through a move for someone who was keen on coming to Spurs. Um, I said about Zerbi, I still think that would be so difficult, unless there's a change of heart there. Um, and obviously, yeah, his little audition at Spurs uh, wasn't the greatest in terms of um, showing his fiery side, which obviously will scare Spurs, as you'd imagine. You know, some people might say that they need to be shaken up by a character like that. Um, it'd be expensive as well. I think there's, it would be quite pricey to get him away. But again, go back to my point, who cares? If you're going to bring in the right man, you should pay what it costs. Um, and then, yeah, Ruben Amrin as well. Um, we know he's been catching the eye. Um, not the greatest of domestic seasons, but a terrific season in Europe. Um, and obviously a very good young manager who's very good with young players and and would certainly get you know the best out of Porro as well when you're just about to sign him for forty million pounds as well. So uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Levy's going to have to push on now and appoint you know the the head coach and director of football pretty much close together or, le or simultaneously maybe even as well. That that process is going to have to take place. Um, he's got to find the perfect blend between the two because you know even doing it the other way doesn't always work. You know, Pratichy came in, ripped up their shortlist and hired Nuno. So it doesn't always say that doing it the way you're supposed to do will work. Um, Mason, if he just wants to push his claims, he's just got to win his remaining matches. That's all he can do, really. Um, obviously, big game next Saturday at Villa Park. They win that game, Spurs, and there's a six-point gap, and it's kind of all but done. They've got Conference League football, um, which, you know, I know some, some fans really don't want that. They think that they should be uh, purely focused on the league. I don't really agree with that. Apart from the fact that I'd like to go on some more European away trips, as I'm sure some of the fans that do those trips would, I still believe that, you know, if you're like me, and I'm sure a lot of fans are, you know, you want a deep squad to be able to handle the Premier League, you need lots of matches to keep that squad getting minutes and happy and and. European competition, whatever you think of, you know, the third tier competition, it does provide that opportunity. And it's a route to a trophy. <laughs> Spurs cannot be fussy about throwing away routes to trophies. Spurs need to win something. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not in the camp of try and finish eighth or whatever so you don't get it. I'm not in that camp at all. Um, but, yeah, yeah, big game. I've uh, got a train all booked to go up there, but there is also a train strike, so I'm not entirely sure whether I'm going to end up having to drive to the thing. We'll see. Um, just want to quickly before I go a bit of housekeeping, talk about the under 21s. Obviously, in midweek we had the under 18s won the Premier League Cup, following on from the under 17s, they've done brilliantly. Under 21s, unfortunately, have not ended the season in the way they wanted to win. They got relegated today to Division Two of Premier League Two. Um, I do feel sorry for them. Um, and Wayne Burnett, their uh, manager. They won 1-0 today. Jamie Donnelly, again, it, it was brilliant in the under-18s Premier League um, Cup final and scored the goal today. They won their final game, but they had to win it by three goals and that would have relegated West Ham, who they were playing. They, you know, they tested the West Ham keeper a lot, just could not find any more ways past him. And they had Lucas Moura playing, Papa Matassar played, Brandon Austin was in goal. But uh, if you're wondering why Lucas was in there, it's because you can have five overage players. And he has been playing with them before during his suspension, when he came back from injury before as well. Um, but I just feel so sorry, like I say, for Wayne Burnett's side. I think some people will look at that and think, it's interesting, those who don't really pay attention to the academy, 
a lot of people go, oh, the academy's rubbish, they're losing games. Then they saw the under-17s, under-18s were doing well, and they were like, what? The other academy's amazing. And now they're confused as to, but wait a minute, the under-21s have gone down. And it's for extenuating circumstances, really has a lot to do with it. Poor old Wayne Burnett, he's had everything thrown at him. Just on a normal football side, he's had injuries to real key players. Um, they brought in two strikers in Will Lancashire and then Jude Sunset Bell, who very quickly picked up season-ending injuries for them. Absolute nightmare. They're, they are proper goal scorers for them as well. Poor old Jamie Donnelly that I've spoken about, he's had to play everywhere this season because of injuries. I've seen him up front, um, central midfield, I've seen him as a number 10, I've seen him out wide at one point. He's been all over the shop trying to help them out in various places. Um, and unfortunately... I wrote this before about Antonio Conte and people, some people at the time took it as a real like, oh, you're trying to bash Conte. And I wasn't. All I was doing was explaining why the under 21s are like they are. Um, so what Antonio Conte would do is he would often call on under 21 players at quite late notice um, to bring into his first team training sessions. But what he would actually do, um, he would actually use them often as static opponents. One of the key things of his training sessions was having a static 11 and then he would walk through the 11 that were going to play and what he wanted to do, constantly go over and over and over a repetition of drills that he wanted to do. But the oppositions would just stand there most of the time. And obviously, that's of no benefit or learning experience really to an under-21 player. And the other consequence was when he was taking a lot of them to create an 11 at times, when especially when Spurs had injuries, it was leaving the under-21 training sessions with no one in it. They were barely even able to put on training sessions for the under-21s. And it would also happen sometimes on match days. So the players would be either unprepared or actually unable to take part in matches. It wasn't a good uh, setup and scenario. It really wasn't at all. So, yeah, so unfortunately they ended up finished second from bottom on goal difference. It was such a tight league. If you have a look at the league table, there's only 14 teams in it. Anyone in the last two weeks could have gone down all the way up to 7th or 8th place. I think only four points separate 8th from Tottenham second to bottom. Um, and they had the same points as Wolves and West Ham above them. But it was goal difference, did them? They had one less than Wolves and they went down. So yeah, it's been a, a season kind of from hell in a way for Wayne Burnett and the way he's been having to deal with having absolutely having no idea who he was training or had in his team to select from each game and sometimes that meant bringing in really young players in and don't get me wrong there's some very exciting young players coming through you know Mikey Moore's a hell of a talent Alfie Dorrington's a hell of a defender as well like I said Jamie uh, Donnelly as well Oliver Iro. I'd like to look at him uh, in recent games as well, uh, when I've seen him, Alfie Devine we know of, and you know, who hopefully get a loan next season as well. Romain Mundell, we're waiting to see what happens with him. Obviously, his contract is petering out towards its end and whether he wants to sign. I did ask a question of Ryan Mason that kind of included Romain Mundell in. Like, he started to talk about anyway, if people don't want to be here, then they don't want to be here. There's nothing we do. And I don't know whether he was talking about Romain or not. Um, I'm intrigued to see what happens with him in the coming weeks because he's a talent. I watched the game today and he played very well uh, in that. It just didn't quite have the cutting edge, but he tried to create things and make them happen. Um, so, yeah, there's talent there. I'm intrigued to see what happens now with practically gone because I kind of got the impression there might have been a bit of a shake-up or not. I don't know which. When you see how well the kind of the young teams are doing and then you take out the extenuating factors of the under-21s, kind of felt like the academy actually is heading somewhere in a good position. So... I know Pratchett was trying to bring in a lot of talent into it, like older talent, you know, they were paying money for the likes of Lancashire and Sunset Bell was a free transfer, but technically I think they'll have to pay some kind of compensation cost at some point. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see which way and how the academy develops now and, and what happens with it. But uh, yeah, so there you go. I think that's everything I could probably talk about. I know... Um, there's a lot more to come from Spurs. There's a lot more on the pitch with these three games to go, but there's also got a tour in the summer as well. I'm, looks like I'm heading off on that, which would be very exciting, off to Australia and Asia. Um, I've already had plenty of people from the countries that Spurs are going to get in touch, saying that they're you know looking forward to welcoming us, uh, the journalists, as well as the uh, the players and the, and the club. So, yeah, be great fun. I always enjoy the tours, not only for the... Uh, for the football and meeting the fans, but also because we're going to have a meet a new manager this time and we get great access to the players. So, But that's all for the future. 
that's all for the future. Right, I'm going to head off now. Enjoy what's left of the sunshine out there. Um, and yeah, and let's see what happens with Tottenham. A little bit more positive video than the last one I, I gave you. Sorry it's been so long, but I wanted to have a proper holiday and you know, didn't want to uh, suddenly start recording a video on holiday. I did that once before and I didn't really want to do that again. It was not fair on the wife. Um, you know, she deserves a good break as well. She uh, works very hard herself. So, um, yeah, right, time to head off. I think I've covered everything I probably wanted to cover. Um, yeah, we'll see how we go, whether we do a midweek one or not. I'm, I'm actually playing at the stadium on Wednesday. You might remember last year I played in a Getir match uh, sponsored by Getir, and it was a fantastic experience. So I've got like, a little hair in my mouth. Um, and they've invited me back. Guesty and I are both going again, so... Uh, that's going to be very cool. Although they gave me quite late notice, so I haven't been able to get into any kind of decent shape for it. But there you go. Just going to enjoy the experience. So uh, might do a video talking about what that's like, and along with any developments that come in the coming days, I'm sure there will be. It's Tottenham, so I'm sure there will be. Yeah, time to head off. As always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.